Good evening, and welcome to Restored Lore, your home for old, odd, and obscure stories on YouTube. Tonight's story is The Magic Sword, as collected by Song Ling Pu. This version of the story was translated and published by Herbert Allen Giles as Strange Stories from a Chinese Studio in 1908. As always, Giles loves to pepper these stories with footnotes, which I will put on screen. They add a bit of extra information, but I don't think they're necessary for enjoying the story. So now, let's open our imaginations and begin. Ning Tsai Chen was a Qi Qiang man and a good-natured, honorable fellow, fond of telling people that he had only loved once. Happening to go to Qinhua, he took shelter in a temple to the north of the city, very nice as far as ornamentation went, but overgrown with grass taller than a man's head, and evidently not much frequented. On either side were the priest's apartments, the doors of which were ajar, with the exception of a small room on the south side, where the lock had a new appearance. In the east corner he espied a group of bamboos growing over a large pool of water lilies in flower, and, being much pleased with the quiet of the place, determined to remain, more especially as, the grand examiner being in the town, all lodgings had gone up in price. So he roamed about, waiting till the priests should return, and in the evening a gentleman came and opened the door on the south side. Ning quickly made up to him, and, with a bow, informed him of his design. "'There is no one here whose permission you need ask,' replied the stranger. "'I am only lodging here, and if you don't object to the loneliness, I shall be very pleased to have the benefit of your society.' Ning was delighted, and made himself a straw bed, and put up a board for a table, as if he intended to remain some time, and that night, by the beams of a clear, bright moon, they sat together on the veranda and talked. The stranger's name was Yen Chi Xia, and Ning thought that he was a student up for the provincial examinations, only his dialect was not that of a Chekiang man. On being asked, he said he came from Shanxi, and there was an air of straightforwardness about all of his remarks. By and by, when their conversation was exhausted, they bade each other good night and went to bed. But Ning, being in a strange place, was quite unable to sleep, and soon he heard sounds of voices from the room on the north side. Getting up, he peeped through a window and saw, in a small courtyard on the other side of a low wall, a woman of about forty with an old maid servant in a long faded gown, humped-backed and feeble-looking. They were chatting by the light of the moon, and the mistress said, "'Why doesn't Xiao Qian come?' She ought to be here by now, replied the other. She isn't offended with you, is she? asked the lady. Not that I know of, answered the old servant, but she seems to want to give trouble. Such people don't deserve to be treated well, said the other, and she had hardly uttered these words when up came a young girl of seventeen or eighteen and very nice looking. The old servant laughed and said, don't talk of people behind their backs. We were just mentioning you as you came without our hearing you, but fortunately we were saying nothing bad about you. As far as that goes, added she, if I were a young fellow, why, I should certainly fall in love with you. If you don't praise me, replied the girl, I'm sure I don't know who will. And then the lady and the girl said something together, and Mr. Ning, thinking they were the family next door, turned round to sleep without paying further attention to them. In a little while no sound was to be heard, but, as he was dropping off to sleep, he perceived that somebody was in the room. Jumping up in great haste, he found it was the young lady he had just seen, and detecting at once that she was going to bewitch him, sternly bade her be gone. She then produced a lump of gold, which he threw away and told her to go after it, or he would call his friend. So she had no alternative but to go, muttering something about his heart being like iron or stone. Next day, a young candidate for the examination came and lodged in the East Room with his servant. He, however, was killed that very night, and his servant the night after. 
the corpses of both showing a small hole in the sole of the foot as if bored by an awl and from which a little blood came. No one knew who had committed these murders, and when Mr. Yen came home, Ning asked him what he thought about it. Yen replied that it was the work of devils, but Ning was a brave fellow, and that didn't frighten him much. In the middle of the night, Xiao Chen appeared to him again and said, I have seen many men, but none with a steel-cold heart like yours. You are an upright man, and I will not attempt to deceive you. I... Sao Qian, whose family name is Ni, died when only eighteen and was buried alongside of this temple. A devil then took possession of me and employed me to bewitch people by my beauty, contrary to my inclination. There is now nothing left in this temple to slay, and I fear that imps will be employed to kill you. Ning was very frightened at this and asked her what he should do. Sleep in the same room with Mr. Yen replied she. What? asked he. Cannot spirits trouble Yen? He is a strange man, she answered, and they don't like going near him. Ning then inquired how the spirits worked. I bewitch people, said Xiao Chen, and then they bore a hole in the foot which renders the victim senseless and proceed to draw off the blood which the devils drink. Another method is to tempt people by false gold, the bones of some horrid demon, and, if they receive it, their hearts and livers will be torn out. Either method is used according to circumstances. Ning thanked her and asked when he ought to be prepared, to which she replied, Tomorrow night. At parting she wept and said, I am about to sink into the great sea with no friendly shore at hand but your sense of duty is boundless, and you can save me. If you will collect my bones and bury them in some quiet spot, I shall not again be subject to these misfortunes. Ning said he would do so, and asked where she lay buried. At the foot of the aspen tree on which there is a bird's nest, replied she, and, passing out of the door, disappeared. The next day, Ning was afraid that Yen might be going away somewhere and went over early to invite him across. Wine and food were produced towards noon, and Ning, who took care not to lose sight of Yen, then asked him to remain there for the night. Yen declined on the grounds that he liked being by himself, but Ning wouldn't hear any excuses and carried all Yen's things to his own room so that he had no alternative but to consent. However, he warned Ning, saying, I know you're a gentleman and a man of honor. If you see anything you don't quite understand, I pray you not to be too inquisitive. Don't pry into my boxes, or it may be the worse for both of us. Ning promised to attend to what he said, and by and by they both lay down to sleep, and Yen, having placed his boxes on the window sill, was soon snoring loudly. Ning himself could not sleep, and after some time he saw a figure moving stealthily outside, at length approaching the window to peep through. Its eyes flashed like lightning, and Ning, in a terrible fright, was just upon the point of calling Yen, when something flew out of one of the boxes like a strip of white silk, and, dashing against the window sill, returned at once to the box, disappearing very much like lightning. Yen heard the noise and got up, Ning all the time pretending to be asleep in order to watch what happened. The former then opened the box and took out something which he smelt and examined by the light of the moon. It was dazzlingly white like crystal, and about two inches in length by the width of an onion leaf in breadth. He then wrapped it up carefully and put it back in the broken box, saying, "'A bold-faced devil, that, to dare thus to break my box!' upon which he went back to bed. But Ning, who was lost in astonishment, arose and asked him what it all meant, telling him, at the same time, what he himself had seen. "'As you and I are good friends,' replied Yen, "'I won't make any secret of it. The fact is, I am a Taoist priest. But for the window sill, the devil would have been killed. As it is, he is badly wounded.' Ning asked him what it was he had there wrapped up, and he told him it was his sword on which he had smelt the presence of the devil. 
At Ning's request, he produced the weapon, a bright little miniature of a sword, and from that time Ning held his friend in higher esteem than ever. Next day, he found traces of blood outside the window which led round to the north of the temple, and there, among a number of graves, he discovered the aspen tree with the bird's nest at its summit. He then fulfilled his promise and prepared to go home, Yen giving him a farewell banquet and presenting him with an old leather case, which he said contained a sword and would keep at a distance from him all devils and bogies. Ning then wished to learn a little of Yen's art, but the latter replied that although he might accomplish this easily enough, being as he was an upright man, yet he was well off in life and not in a condition where it would be of any advantage to him. Ning then pretending that he had a younger sister buried here, dug up Xiao Chen's bones, and, having wrapped them up in grave clothes, hired a boat and set off on his way home. On his arrival, as his library looked towards the open country, he made a grave hard by and buried the bones there, sacrificing and invoking Xiao Chen as follows. In pity for your lonely ghost, I have placed your remains near my humble cottage where we shall be near each other, and no devil will dare annoy you. I pray you not reject my sacrifice, poor though it be. After this he was proceeding home when he suddenly heard himself addressed from behind, the voice asking him not to hurry, and turning around he beheld Xiao Chen, who thanked him, saying, were I to die ten times for you, I could not discharge my debt. Let me go home with you and wait upon your father and mother. You will not repent it. Looking closely at her, he observed that she had a beautiful complexion and feet as small as bamboo shoots, being altogether much prettier now that he came to see her by daylight. So they went together to his home and... Bidding her wait a while, Ning ran in to tell his mother, to the very great surprise of the old lady. Now Ning's wife had been ill for a long time, and his mother advised him not to say a word about it to her for fear of frightening her, in the middle of which in rushed Xiao Qin and threw herself on the ground before them. This is the young lady, said Ning, whereupon his mother, in some alarm, turned her attention to Xiao Qin, who cried out, a lonely orphan, without brother or sister, the object of your son's kindness and compassion, begs to be allowed to give her poor services as some return for favors shown. Ning's mother, seeing that she was a nice, pleasant-looking girl, began to lose fear of her, and replied, Madam, the preference you show for my son is highly pleasing to an old body like myself. But this is the only hope of our family, and I hardly dare agree to his taking a devil wife. I have but one motive in what I ask, answered Xiao Chen. And if you have no faith in disembodied people, then let me regard him as my brother, and live under your protection, serving you like a daughter. Ning's mother could not resist her straightforward manner, and Xiao Qin asked to be allowed to see Ning's wife, but this was denied on the plea that the lady was ill. Xiao Qin then went into the kitchen and got ready the dinner, running about the place as if she had lived there all her life. Ning's mother was, however, much afraid of her and would not let her sleep in the house. So Xiao Qian went to the library and was just entering when suddenly she fell back a few steps and began walking hurriedly backwards and forwards in front of the door. Ning, seeing this, called out and asked her what it meant, to which she replied, The presence of that sword frightens me, and that is why I could not accompany you on your way home. Ning at once understood her and hung up the sword case in another place whereupon she entered, lighted a candle, and sat down. For some time she did not speak, at length asking Ning if he studied at night or not. For, said she, when I was little, I used to repeat the Leng Yen Sutra, but now I have forgotten more than half, and therefore I should like to borrow a copy, and when you are at leisure in the evening you might hear me. Ning said he would, and they sat silently there for some time, after which Xiao Qian went away and took up her quarters elsewhere. 
Morning and night she waited on Ning's mother, bringing water for her to wash in, occupying herself with household matters, and endeavoring to please her in every way. In the evening, before she went to bed, she would always go in and repeat a little of the sutra, and leave as soon as she thought Ning was getting sleepy. Now, the illness of Ning's wife had given his mother a great deal of extra trouble, more, in fact, than she was equal to, but ever since Xiao Chen's arrival, all this was changed, and Ning's mother felt kindly disposed to the girl in consequence, gradually growing to regard her almost as her own child, and forgetting quite that she was a spirit. Accordingly, she didn't make her leave the house at night, and Xiao Chen, who, being a devil, had not tasted meat or drink since her arrival, now began at the end of six months to take a little thin gruel. Mother and son alike became very fond of her, and henceforth never mentioned what she really was. Neither were strangers able to detect the fact. By and by, Ning's wife died, and his mother secretly wished him to espouse Xiao Qian, although she rather dreaded any unfortunate consequences that might arise. This Xiao Qian perceived, and, seizing an opportunity, said to Ning's mother, "'I have been with you now more than a year, and you ought to know something of my disposition. Because I was unwilling to injure travelers, I followed your son hither.' There was no other motive, and, as your son has shown himself one of the best of men, I would now remain with him for three years, in order that he may obtain from me some mark of imperial approbation which will do me honor in the realms below. Ning's mother knew that she meant no evil, but hesitated to put the family hopes of posterity into jeopardy. Xiao Chen, however, reassured her by saying that Ning would have three sons and that the line would not be interrupted by his marrying her. On the strength of this, the marriage was arranged, to the great joy of Ning, a feast prepared and friends and relatives invited, and, when in response to a call, the bride herself came forth in her gay wedding dress, the beholders took her rather for a fairy than for a devil." After this, numbers of congratulatory presents were given by the various female members of the family who vied with one another in making her acquaintance, and these Xiao Chen returned by gifts of paintings of flowers done by herself in which she was very skillful, the receivers being extremely proud of such marks of her friendship. One day she was leaning at the window in a despondent mood when suddenly she asked where the sword case was. Oh replied Ning. As you seemed afraid of it, I moved it elsewhere. I have now been so long under the influence of surrounding life, said Xiao Chen, that I shan't be afraid of it any more. Let us hang it on the bed. Why so? asked Ning. For the last three days, explained she, I have been much agitated in mind, and I fear that the devil at the temple, angry at my escape, may come suddenly and carry me off. So Ning brought the sword case, and Xiao Qian, after examining it closely, remarked, This is where the magician puts people. I wonder how many were slain before it got old and worn out as it is now. Even now, when I look at it, my flesh creeps. The case was then hung up, and next day removed to over the door. At night they sat up and watched, Xiao Qian warning Ning not to go to sleep, and suddenly something fell down flop like a bird. Xiao Qian, in a fright, got behind the curtain, but Ning looked at the thing and found it was an imp of darkness with glaring eyes and a bloody mouth coming straight to the door. Stealthily creeping up, it made a grab at the sword case and seemed about to tear it in pieces when bang! The sword case became as big as a wardrobe, and from it a devil protruded part of his body and dragged the imp in. Nothing more was heard, and the sword case resumed its original size. Ning was greatly alarmed, but Xiao Chen came out rejoicing and said, There's an end of my troubles. In the sword case, they found only a few quarts of clear water, nothing else. After these events, Ning took his doctor's degree, and Xiao Qian bore him a son. He then took a concubine and had one more son by each, all of whom became in time distinguished men.
The best sentence in this story is buried in a footnote. The text says she had a beautiful complexion and feet as small as bamboo shoots, and Giles inserts a footnote that bamboo shoots, well cooked, are a very good substitute for asparagus. <laughs> I can't imagine how he would have thought that that information was relevant in any way, but it was clearly so important that he just had to insert it. There is so much weird folklore in this story. A girl dies and is buried, and for some reason, devils are able to take possession of her body and use it to entice people to their deaths without in any way affecting her consciousness. She could be rescued from this kind of possession by reburying her bones somewhere else, but then she can still take on a corporeal form and live in your house and do chores and eventually bury you a child, although never really becoming a living person. Meanwhile, the priest has a magic box which contains a magic sword that automatically springs out like a jack-in-the-box and kills imps and demons. And although Ning was supposed to have a magic sword case with a magic sword in it, when it finally activates, it becomes a big box with a big devil inside that grabs the imp, and there's no sword at all, only some water. Was the imp turned into water? Also, I don't know if you noticed, but the first sword, Yen's sword, was described as being two inches long and as wide as an onion leaf, which is an amazing way to combine units of measurement. I honestly love these kind of things where there's just no internal consistency and the rules and the context just keep shifting and moving around, but the story just barrels right on regardless. Internal consistency is overrated. I wish that there was a better translation or better vocabulary than terms like devil and imp. In Japanese, almost every monster is translated into English as a goblin, but when you read about what they do and what they're capable of, it's obvious that that monster is not a goblin. Likewise, I don't think these creatures are devils or imps, or even that those terms are useful here. I can see why Giles, writing a hundred years ago, might have chosen those words, but I think it would have been better to use the Chinese word so we would approach the creature with a kind of fresh cognition and no preconceived notions. He should have used the Chinese word yao guai, sorry for the pronunciation there, and explained more about them in a footnote, after all, he loves footnotes. Yao guai is often translated in English as devil or demon, but in English those terms refer to creatures that are both supernatural and evil. In China, they are supernatural and amoral. They might be capricious, but they're not inherently bad. They often have a harmful influence on people. They cause erratic behavior and bewilderment, and sometimes they cause natural disasters and misfortunes, but in that sense they're more like a Celtic fairy than a Christian devil. Generally speaking, they are capable of shape-shifting, creating illusions, mind control, possession of humans, and some influence over natural forces. They can arise from disturbances in the natural or cosmic order, they can emerge from aberrant natural energies, or even from normal natural energies over long periods of time, like from the energies of a river or a stone or a mountain or anything that's around for a long time, or they might be deliberately cultivated. Fox spirits are said to attain their magic powers by careful study over hundreds of years. Or the femme fatale type of Yao may become more powerful by seducing and consuming humans. This is also why their powers vary so much. Presumably, over more time, they become stronger and able to do more things. Finally, some Yao might be demoted gods, immortal creatures who leave heaven and hang around in the world, causing trouble. Yao means weird, supernatural, or strange, along with an element of being seductive or beguiling, while guai means strange and unusual, with elements of monster or weird creature. And I find that term far more interesting than words like imp or devil. If you listen all the way to the end of the video, you get to hear me make a little confession. This week's confession is that we are sneaking up on 1,000 subscribers, and I am pretty excited about it. As you may already know, YouTube monetizes a channel at 1,000 subscribers and 4,000 watch hours, and we are nearly there. Obviously, it's more symbolic than financial, but it is a pretty big milestone. 
Like most content creators, I have some ideas about what the future might hold in terms of membership or what shape this community might take, but those ideas aren't very specific yet. I know that even amateur YouTubers are supposed to begin by choosing their niche and building their brand, which then drives their business plan and their development strategy, but uh, I haven't done any of that. I've actually spent a lot of time working in marketing, so you might think that I would have all of these skills to apply to this project, but in fact, it's the exact opposite. I am so sick of that type of work and of interacting with the world in that way. And this channel is meant to be a hobby and a recreation and a source of enjoyment. So I'm deliberately not treating it like a business or mapping out a development strategy. I'm being guided by my intuition and I'm kind of feeling my way along terribly unprofessional. I do absolutely have a wish list of things I would invest in if I could spend some money on this project. And I have some ideas about how we all could go on to shape the channel together, but that's a ways away. If you want to be part of this little adventure, or if you just like listening to strange and obscure stories, subscribe to the channel. Choose notifications so you don't miss a story and tune in every week. Please also help the channel grow and reach the next phase by liking this video, dropping me a comment, and sharing it with somebody you know. Thank you so much for the support. It really does mean the world for me.